Father, we just give you honor and glory for what you are doing in our midst. We thank you, Father, that you ordain and orchestrate every one of our footsteps. We call upon your anointing to come even stronger and even deeper into our hearts. Fathers, we go forth with this teaching. We pray that it would go deep into our spirit means, our souls, and our bodies, and that it would accomplish the works that you want to accomplish. We give you honor and glory for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Dark Trinity. We started a little bit talking about Jonathan Kahn's book, um, The Return of the Gods, and he did a message that was out on Sid Roth. So the notes are from this message and some, some of the things he placed in the book. These are things that you need to know about that are going on with America. Um, this isn't anything that anyone has made up. These are realities that we're dealing with. Jonathan Kahn exposes the sinister plans of the Dark Trinity in his book, The Return of the Gods. The gods returned because of the demons of Baal, Ashtoreth, and Molech. This is the Dark Trinity. Gods were all over the ancient world. The Bible says that behind the gods in the Hebrew scripture was something called the Shaddam. Shaddam comes from the Hebrew root word shud, which means to act violently, to lay waste, to devastate that which brings destruction. In ancient Babylonian writings, the word shaddam or shadu speaks of spirits, protective or malevolent. M malevolent means bad. A malevolent spirit would lay waste and devastate and bring destruction. When ancient Jewish scholars rendered the Hebrew Bible into Greek in a translation known as the Septuagint, they had to find the right word in Greek to stand for Shaddam. The word they used could refer to a spirit, a principality, an occult entity, a god. The word was daim daimonium. It is from this that we get the word demon, a malevolent or evil spirit. In the Jewish world, the Shaddam are demonic spirits. Deuteronomy 32, 17, they sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Psalms 106, 36 to 37, they served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. In the New Testament, Paul says behind the gods are things being called the daimonia. We get the word demon from it, so these are spirits. These are not just figments of people's imagination. They are real beings filled with purpose of destroying anything that is godly. And so the thing is that back then, if all of these cultures were given to the gods, it means they were given to these spirits. It means they were possessed. It means Western civilization was possessed by those spirits. But now what happens is the Messiah comes into the world and with him comes power over the spirits. And this is an interesting perspective. The Messiah comes and drives the spirits out of the world, therefore pushing the gods back into extinction. When Jesus' gospel goes into the Roman Empire and the Western civilization, it starts ending the existence of the gods. The first coming of Jesus Christ did destroy a kingdom of darkness. And a lot of people, when you look at the Jews, they wanted someone to come in and be a ruler over them. Ephesians 4, 7 to 9. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, this, he ascended, but what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And we know that to be, he went into hell. His coming the first time sent the demons running. He crushed the spirits behind the gods that ruled over the earth. The gods left their templates, 
their, left their temples that were erected to their honor as the power of God filled the earth. So because of our Western culture, up until the 1960s, the demons were not manifested out in the open as they are now. And everywhere you go, you can see a demon manifested. This changed as the United States started turning its back on God. Luke 11, verses 24 to 26, and verses 29 to 32. This is a principle that Jonathan Kahn uses to go out and explain when the, when the demons leave a person and they come back, they find that the person is clean, so they come back seven times stronger. Every one of us who've been through deliverance and exorcism yourself, this is nothing to play with. You know, we, we tell you all the time when you sit in that chair or when the Lord starts working on you in service, you need to stay clean. You need to stay pure. Because if not, they're going to come back stronger. Luke 11, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. In the last state of that man is worse than the first. Verse 29, and while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. What this gospel is saying is that we have Jesus. We have no excuse to stay in a place of darkness. This scripture explains what is going on in the world today from the time that Jesus left the earth until now. So now, after a period of time, the demons returned. The earth is more possessed than it ever was because it had brought back seven stronger than itself. So think about this. These gods and these spirits didn't just disappear. They went, according to this scripture, waited. They came back to the earth. They came back to the United States. Oh, it's clean. It's nice. They built up even stronger strongholds in the United States, in the places in the world that they left. They repossessed the people here. They repossessed the people here. Then they think he's talking about a man. He uses a man, but he says no. He says this. So it will be with this generation. He's talking about a whole generation of people. A whole generation of people being repossessed. If you take that principle, apply it in the biggest way, here is a warning. Our culture was free from demons because Jesus had expelled them. When the first settlers came here, they were seeking freedom from religious persecution. They left England, they left Europe because they did not want to be under the bondage of that religious spirit. Columbus was a Jew who was bringing persecuted Jews here to escape the persecution that was going on in Spain and Europe. We started good, but now our state is worse because when the original spirits were cast out, now they have returned and found the house clean and they have brought seven more of their bigger brothers. If America completely turns away from God, then the doors are going to be open for the spirits to return to repossess our culture. The door will be open for the gods, the ancient gods who are behind the spirits, who are behind them to come back and repossess our culture. When you look at what's happened, the craziness of what's been happening in the last 50 years in America, 
it's because the gods have come back. What happened with Israel started removing prayer early six, in the early 60s. These are all these things that cast the gods out, prayer. So if you remove them, then what's going to happen? You're opening the door for repossession. The first spirit, the demon of Baal, the first god or the first principality, the one who always begins it, his name actually means the possessor. Baal means the possessor. We know him as Baal. He is the possessor. So the first thing Baal did to ancient Israel was to cause them to forget their God. He caused them to forget their God. And Baal caused them to start driving God out of their lives. Significant. The spirit of Baal in America, in the West, has been driving God out. If you look at our culture, they don't want anything to do with God. The Bible says Baal caused them to turn away from the commandments. Literally, in America, we have actually cast down the Ten Commandments. So what are we watching? It's the repaganization of America. His job or his mission is to take a Judeo-Christian nation and turn it into a pagan nation. That's Baal. Baal is the god of fertility. His worshipers prayed to him to make, the f to make fertile the soil and cause their crops to grow. They called him the Lord of the rain, master of the waters that caused the earth to bear fruit. He was the God who rode on the clouds, the Lord of the storms. He was the one who hurled down bolts of lightning on the earth. If he prospered, everyone prospered. If he languished, so did the people. Baal was a warrior. He went into battle with his fellow gods over and over again, and he would reign supreme over his world. It was the role he played with regard to the nation of Israel for which he is most known and most notorious. For Baal, chief god of the Canaanite world, his name came to be translated as Lord, Owner, Master. It was not long after the Israelites settled in the promised land that they began turning away from God. Turning away from God. Baal promises fertility, fruitfulness, increase, gain, and prosperity. As it began to cultivate the land, the temptation to invoke his powers proved more and more compelling. Many Israelites turned away from God to Baal. Baal was the embodiment of paganism and of all pagan gods. He was the epitome of all that was not God and all the word against him. There was the other God, the substitute God, the instead of God. This is all Baal. These are all different characteristics of Baal. He's, he's a substitute. He was Israel's anti-God. He was the God that Israel turned to when it turned away from God. The, the crazy part is you're going to worship something. If you're not worshiping the one true God, there's something inside of you that's made to worship. You're going to worship some devil. Have you ever thought about that? So why not just worship the one true God and stay with him? You'll get more out of it. He was the God who separated Israel from his God, who drew it away, who made it forget the God of its foundation. Baal was the god of apostasy. Aren't we seeing a lot of falling away right now? The apostasy, don't want to hear anything about God, don't teach me anything, I don't want to learn. Baal's mission was to take a nation that had known and been consecrated to God and turn it away from God. In the mid-20th century, America was decidedly Christian or Judeo-Christian. Listen to this. 
it stood in clear opposition to Marxist the ideology and the atheism of the Soviet, Russia, and communist China. This is what America used to be. It was a nation in which the majority of those on the political left and right saw themselves as sincere followers of Jesus or God, and in which politicians would freely cite God and Christian values in their public discourse. This is what we used to have. This is what used to be. America in the mid 20th century was a nation in which children were not only allowed to pray in public schools, but actually led in prayer by their teachers. Where teachers read the word of God in their classrooms, and it was in America that declared itself one nation under God. This is where Baal came into play. The mission of Baal is to cause the nation that is known by God to stop knowing him and then to forget him. Baal caused Israel to forget God by the end of the process. It can no longer remember or imagine what it was like to have known him. So when Baal returns to the modern world, his mission was the same, to cause America and the West to forget its God. Though the seeds of America's turning from God can be found in earlier days, it will become most noticeable in the 60s, when America removed prayer from school. The act was soon followed by banning God's word from instruction of our nation's children. The nation was becoming increasingly alienated from the ways of God. The law that God gave Israel as a safeguard against the gods and the ways of paganism the very first of the Ten Commandments was, you shall have no other gods before me. So for Baal to gain possession of Israel, he had to separate the people from the law of God. What do we have going on today? And as it was summed up, the Ten Commandments, the writer of Second Kings confirmed what happened. So they left all the commandments of the Lord, their God. So in 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that it was no longer legal to display the Ten Commandments in public schools. Downgrading. We're destroying ourselves. The Ten Commandments later came under governmental judgment and were banished from the public square altogether. Once the word of God was removed, there was nothing left to hold back. The nation falls. No absolute standard. The guardrails were down. There was nothing to stop what would soon follow. This is exactly what has been happening. Baal was the first spirit in. The spirit comes and says, Let's, let me get my friends. And it infected everything. Let's talk about the second spirit. In the Bible, she's called Estoreth. Ashtoreth. In Mesopotamia, she's called Ishtar. When she went into the Greek land, she was called Aphrodite. And then Venus. She is all over, and she's mentioned specifically there now in the kingdom of mythology. She's actually the wife of Baal. Baal has a wife. From the very beginning, the two gods, Baal and Ashtoreth, were linked together. The fact that they could be portrayed in their mythologies as married or as lovers would account for some of it. But the connection between the two gods is deeper and one that transcends mythology. Baal is first, then Asterith. Baal leads to Asterith. What comes in with Asterith is unbridled sexuality, licentiousness, decadence, the worship of Baal had all the elements of these things, but Ashtoreth was their incarnation. The god of apostasy ushered in the goddess of sexual licentiousness and debauchery. Surely, after America's turning from God began manifesting in the 60s, sexuality took a turn. The effect of the goddess return to America could be summed up in three words the sexual revolution. 
This means that the pagan sexual values would overturn biblical ones. The sexual revolution was another dimension of paganizing the nation of America in Western civilization. The aim of the goddess was to destroy the morality and faith by which she was expelled to. To do that, she would have to take a Christian nation of civilization that with regard to sexuality and marriage upheld biblical morality and practices and led it into embracing pagan morality and practices. In other words, you start getting these false doctrines about everything you do in your bedroom is between you and God. You and your spouse, nobody needs to know. You start doing these things, and this is coming from pulpits. We have seen the dynamic of deification. When an individual nation or civilization turns away from God, that which is not God will become as God. It will assume the aura of the Godhead. When an individual nation or civilization turns away from God, that which is not God will become as God. It will assume the aura of the Godhead. At some point in time, I believe God has shared with Pastor Barber that the abomination of desolation had started. Here this is. This is, this is proof of that because they're worshiping sex. One of those things that are not God is sex. When Israel turned away from God, sex in the form of the goddess Ashtoreth or Ishtar was deified. Sex became a god. Sex thus became an end and a goal to be pursued in and of itself. And you've heard us say in here before, people go in the bushes all the time. And it means nothing to them. It means absolutely nothing to them. Therefore, it could now be divorced from marriage or any other context and be followed with no regard for context or any other thing. It was the former standards and restraints that were seen as sinful, puritanical, repressive, and evil, and the one who opposed the newly sanctified sins or failed to adequately revere them was now treated as something of a heretic. And the opposition to the new morality as something akin to blasphemy. What the spirit of Baal had begun, the spirit of Ashtoreth had taken to another level. The work of each god was to bring out the inversion of civilization. Ashtoreth had inverted the realm of sexuality. She had taken that one, that which was forbidden, unspoken, and taboo, and step by step introduced it into the mainstream culture. All of these things that are going on now were not going on. And there's, there's a lie that's been, been perpetrated and sent. The shock of each step would be followed by familiarity, numbness, then toleration, then acceptance, and then celebration. At the end of the process, Americans would be championing, championing, championing what they had forbidden and forbidding what they had championed the gay pride parades. All of that stuff is out in the open and is, is promoted, celebrated, and it's all because of a stare. At the end of the process, Americans would be championing what they had forbidden and forbidding what they had championed. As an enchantress, a sterif tempted, allured, and captivated. She calls her followers to abandon reason and rationality. That was deep. Abandon reason and rationality to do what they otherwise would never have done. We have people doing things with animals that should not be done. Shouldn't be done. She cast spells. She worked magic. Thus, her ability to seduce was all the more potent. 
There was another form of intoxication that so dramatically exploded in American and Western culture that it would in part defile, defined the 1960s. That is of the drugs. Mind-altering drugs or psychedelic drugs radically altered perception, thinking, and behavior. The state of intoxication and altered consciousness was now glorified as an ideal to be sought after. All people wanted to do was to get into this altered state and stay in that state. Stay high. Stay out of reality. And so when Baal comes, the next one to come, it says in the Bible, says Baal. Then it says a store. Then she's coming in. So with this, what this means is once the door is open, she is the goddess of sexuality, of sexual immorality. She's actually called a prostitute. She is a goddess who her temples were filled with sexuality. It was made public. So if she returns, what would happen? If she comes in, it means that America's going to undergo a sexual revolution. These are things that have already taken place. That is the sign of the possession of Ishtar, or this goddess. And the thing is, what she did, what a prosecutor is, she actually damages marriage. She actually weakens marriage. That's what happens. Bring sexuality into the culture. In ancient times in Israel, the Middle East, she put her images of naked people all over the culture. And that's what happened. And so not only she was in her Greek form, she gave birth to a child named Eros. We get the word erotica. So erotica starts flooding America. The word for prostitute, which is what she was in her Greek incarnation, is the word porne. We get the word porn from it. So there's an explosion of pornography all over our culture. So what Baal does, in one sense, she's repaganized and made stronger. She's overturning biblical standards of sexuality and marriage, and she is paganizing our culture through sexuality and through possessing it. And she's also the goddess of spells and witchcraft. So she casts her spell on America, and we are still in it to this day. It's irrational. It's not natural at all. Something strange about the goddess, and that is that has to do with gender. Because what she also did, let me tell you in her ancient inscriptions, I'm looking at these ancient inscriptions. She says, I am a woman. I am a man. It's said in her hymns. It says she has the power to transform a man into a woman and a woman into a man. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen if she comes into the culture? You're going to start seeing what she's doing. Is she going to start? She's going to start masculinizing women. Masculinizing women and defeminizing women and feminizing men. We see this now. We see this right now. That touches everything. I mean, touches our culture, touches the roles, touches radical feminism and sexuality. And so all this stuff around saying, how could this happen? This is all the goddess. It's all there. And so all this stuff around saying, how could this happen? This is all the goddess. It's all there. She had a priesthood. Her priests listened to this in her temples. They were men who were dressed up as women and they acted as women. Dress up. So what's going to happen if she comes back? What's going to happen is, as she possesses a culture, is that men will start dressing. We'll start seeing that in our culture, which we do. These are her ancient priesthood. They were involved in same-sex sexuality. We see the explosion as well. Also, it says, remember, she turns men into women, transitions them and women into men. 
her priests, many of her priests were actually surgically altered. She caused them to be surgically altered. What's going on now? They're trying to get people to do this. They're trying to get our young children confused and messed up. This is Ashtaroth under the influence of Baal. We do it more sophisticated now today, and that is that the goddess was in charge. He was a goddess of parades. She had parades happening all over. And when I looked at the ancient inscriptions of the parades, it describes them and says in the parades, the men would dress up as women. We've seen this. In the parades, the women would dress as men. It would be a parade of gender bending. And that's exactly what, when you see this happening now, that's the sign of the goddess. Yes, this blew me away. Since these things happened, there has been three landmark cases that have to do with gender and all these things, same sex and marriage. The first one was in 2003. It had to do with legalizing. It happened in the month, the ancient month of Tamils. That's the lover of Ishtar. That's her month. That's her month. It happened at the exact time happened at the exact date of the goddess. The next one happened in 2013. They struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. That happened the same month, the same exact day of the month of the goddess, the time of the summer solstice. All these pagan things, the last one which struck down marriage, we all remember that, that happened, the month of the goddess, days of the goddess, same time, same date, June 26th. And Sid, remember when marriage was changed. Remember when that happened. We all remember it. That night, all of America, rainbows appeared. And one of them appeared on the White House. Remember that? Well, that night on the ancient calendar, I looked this up, was the night that is appointed the 10th of Tammuz, appointed to cast a spell to cause a man to love a man. On that day, it was all determined by the mystery of the God. Well, America is the head of nations right now. Whatever happens to America is going to touch the world. And America, I think America said, was founded after the pattern of ancient Israel from the beginning for the Puritans. So it's been blessed as Israel was, but the warning even goes back to John Winthrop, the Puritan. He said, if you ever turn away if we turn away and go after the gods, then the curses that came on Israel are coming on us. You know, the great people of God, they always dealt with, they dealt with God. Moses, Elijah, we're in the same boat right now. The apostles, let me give you an example just to give you how it's beyond everything, what we just spoke about in the last part. This whole thing about gender, Spirit number three, the destroyer. The other one, the God who comes in here at the end, this is the destroyer. We know him as Molech. And that is he causes Israel to actually lift up their own children on altars and kill them. What are we doing with the abortions? In some, some states, it's infanticide because they're allowing the women to kill their children after they've been born. We know him as Molech, and that is he causes Israel to actually lift up their own children on the altars and kill them. Well, that's a pagan thing. We say never in America, but the warning is if America turns away from God, Molech's coming, and we're going to start offering up our children. So that's exactly what happened starting in the late 60s, early 70s. Just when, this, just when this one God leads to the next. The ancient tablets of Molech is that they also particularly lift up the sacrificed, the poor children. And that's exactly what's happened in America too. Well, because it actually said, the historian said that the poor children, they're actually sold to be sacrificed. 
So to this day, it's the minorities and the poor who are actually Molech's focus. And one of the sickest things is the African American community refusing to hear that abortion is wrong. The African American church refusing to hear that abortion is wrong because women have a right to choose in their eyes. We're following in these steps and these footsteps of these gods. And if we don't change, what's going to happen to America? What's going to happen to our country? Three spirits that we're dealing with that are brought in ultimate destruction to the United States. Saints, we cannot ignore what is going on. We can't pretend that it's not happening because it is. It really is. And the church, some people in the church get it, but some people in the church refuse to get it. They don't want to hear it. They, they would rather keep their head in the sand and pretend that it's not going on. But we're losing people. People are dying. People are going to hell because we're not speaking up and we're not doing what's right according to God's eyes about this. Father, I just thank you for everything that Jonathan Kahn brought out. I thank you for him exposing the darkness that is in America. We pray, Father God, that you would lead God and direct us as to what our part is in this hour and how we need to bring this to an end in America. We pray for revival. We pray for a change of hearts. We pray for true repentance to take place amongst the leaders and amongst the people. And God, we thank you for letting it start with us and letting us become the people that you need us to be to carry your light into this dark, dark world. What I'm hearing is that the Lord wants to give you a brighter light today so that you can take that light out into the darkness and to destroy the works of the enemy with truth. As you come to the altar, ask the Lord to take that light and make it brighter.